the whole aim of this video is to give you a good overview of LCL injuries of the knee, so lateral collateral ligament injuries. So we're going to look at the anatomy of it, how it gets injured, the typical symptoms you may feel, how you can diagnose it, so what type of tests um, people use for that, the grading system. Then we'll look at whether you need surgery or not, and what the typical recovery times are, and how you can treat it without surgery. Now, this is going to be a long video, so if you want to jump to different sections, have a look. I've made chapters to make it easy for you. If you're looking for exercises for LCL strains, there's a whole video about just that. I've also made a whole video about braces. I'll put links to those in the description of this video. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mareika. I'm one of the physiotherapists from sportsinjuryphysio.com, where you can get online physiotherapy assessment as well as treatment for your injuries. Have a look at the description of this video if you want a link to our website. Your lateral collateral ligament runs over the outside of your knee joint, so like that if this is the outside of the joint. Um, it runs from the femur to the head of the fibula, and that's why it's also sometimes called the fibula ligament. Now, it has two main jobs. One is that it stops the knee joint from gapping over the outside because it holds it together, but it also stops it from turning back excessively when you um, run and walk and jump. And it has a few other structures that actually helps it in that job. So your IT band comes and attaches over there, which helps with it, your lateral or outer head of your gastrocnemius, which is your calf muscle can help with that job, and your popliteus muscle as well and also your cruciate ligaments. And this is important because often when you injure your LCL ligament, you also injure your cruciate ligaments, and that makes the knee then more unstable. So the more of these things that you injure, the worse the injury is. Uh, it is actually quite rare to just injure the LCL ligament, but in cases where that happens, recovery is much, much easier if you haven't actually injured any of the other things. Now, it is different in shape from your MCL, the medial collateral ligament, which if the LCL is there, the medial collateral ligament is on the inner side of the knee, that side, in that it's more of a tubular ligament, which makes it a lot stronger. And you remember you've got menisci or a meniscus on the inner side and outside of your knee joint between the two bones. Your medial collateral ligament attaches to the meniscus. Your lateral one, lateral collateral ligament, doesn't attach to it. Why is this important? Well, because Often when you sprain or tear your MCL, you actually then injure your meniscus as well because they're attached. Whereas with your LCL, you can injure only the ligament and not the meniscus because they're not attached. So that's brilliant. Now, if you think of where the LCL runs, it runs right over the outside there. The injuring movement is a force that comes from the inner front of the knee and forces it out that way so that it stretches over the outside. And this usually happens when either somebody runs into you or you're on the floor and somebody falls on you or with tennis and gymnastics you're simply putting all your weight through over onto that side and for some reason it just decides to go. What's the difference between an LCL strain or tear or rupture even? All LCL strains and tears and ruptures um, involve tearing off the fibers of the ligament but people tend to call a less serious one like a grade one or so a strain and a more serious one a tear or a rupture but it's not a medical definition we prefer to use the grading system I'll talk to you about in a minute to rather decide how serious it is. What symptoms may tell you that you've got an LCL tear? Well the most important thing is that a LCL tear happens suddenly. It's not something that develops slowly over time so if your pain comes on gradually or only several hours after you've done something and there wasn't any injuring movement, you didn't feel it come on suddenly, it's likely not going to be an LCL strain or tear. It's going to be something else like ITB syndrome or something like that. The second is that the pain is very much over the outside of the knee in the area where the LCL is. And you may have a bit of swelling there, but it usually doesn't swell a lot when you only have an LCL tear. It just looks a little bit puffy. If your knee is very, very swollen, it means that you've likely also injured something else inside of your knee. Now, it may be that you've not injured your LCL, it's just your meniscus on that side that's sore and caused the swelling, or it may be that you've actually got a combination, something else inside the knee as well as the LCL. 
The most common things that can cause a lot of swelling is meniscus injuries or cruciate ligament injuries in the knee. Then you may also injure your fibular nerve. The fibular nerve runs around the head of the fibula and when you do any movement that forces that gapping motion on the outer side of the knee, that can also strain the, um, the nerve there. And signs that you may have injured that is if you have changes of sensation, so tingling, numbness, funny sensations, burning on the outer lower leg area. That may mean that you've injured your nerve as well. And then finally, it may also feel that your knee is a bit unstable. Now for grade one LCL tears, you usually don't feel much instability. Um, unless you you catch it in a, in a certain way, it may go, oh, I, that's really painful. But for knee to feel really unstable, you usually have a more serious, so a grade three or serious grade two LCL strain, or you've also injured one of the other ligaments or structures that's meant to help with the stability. So your cruciate ligaments or your popliteal muscle or even your IT band or your capsule on the back there. What are the best tests for LCL strains or tears? Now, there are two ways to test for it. One is doing a physical test that your doctor or physiotherapist will do in the clinic to see how much your leg moves. And the second is that you can use scans. Now, interestingly enough, it's not the scan results, but actually the results from the physical test that is used to decide whether a person needs surgery or not. So let's first look at that test. Now the physical test is called the varus test and varus is just the force that tries to gap the outer edge and that's what we're going to do with the test. We're going to see if we apply a force on the inner side of the leg trying to gap the outer edge how much it moves. Now whenever you do any tests for ligaments you always want to test the uninjured side first so that you understand how much movement the person normally has because some of us just have a bit of laxity in our, our ligaments and we're looking for a difference between the uninjured side and the injured side. Also when you apply that force be gentle and slow because it's a scary thing for somebody who's just had a knee injury for somebody to now be handling it and if you're too rough your patient won't um, relax enough to get a good result from it to really see what's going on. What you do is the person lies on their back um, fully re um, relaxed and you take hold of the uh, the leg with your one hand over the inner edge of the knee joint because you remember you want to apply the force so the outer edge is going to try and gap and the other hand holds around the ankle and what you do is while you pull on the ankle so you pull towards you you push gently with your heel of your hand against the inner edge of the knee so that you try to gap the um, the knee joint so we're doing this test first with the knee bent to 30 degrees knee flexion and you look at how much gapping do you get one leg versus the other leg then you repeat it in zero degrees and what you can find is that if it gaps when it's bent to 30 degrees but the gap disappears or it doesn't actually move much more than the uninjured side when the leg is fully straight, that's a really good sign because that means you've likely got an isolated LCL injury and they can usually heal without any surgery even if it's a grade three. But if it gaps in the 30 degrees as well as the um, zero degrees knee flexion, so fully straight leg, that's not a great sign because that means you've likely also injured some of the other structures that's meant to provide stability to the knee and often those situations require surgery. If you've got a grade one and there's no gapping in either of them, that's a brilliant sign. You'll likely just get pain then over that outer knee when you try to gap it because the ligament will be going, oh, don't gap me, but it's still strong. So that shows us that it's a stable LCL injury and it will do really good with rehab. Most cases of LCL injuries can be diagnosed through simply doing the physical test. However, if your doctor or physio feels that mm, your case is a bit more serious or there's something they need to understand better, rule in or rule out, they may request some scans. Two types of scans that can be really useful is the first is an x-ray. Now x-rays don't show ligaments but they can show bones and because it takes so much force to injure an LCL ligament you often get fractures with that or little pieces of bone pulling out and an x-ray can show you that. So that's a really good reason to get that even though it won't show you the ligament specifically. But then MRI scans are, is the next step up because they show you the LCL ligament but they can also show you meniscus injuries, they can show you injuries to the other structures like the ACL, PCL, um, the 
back of the knee capsule, all of those elements that may be injured. So it's a really good way to understand the full extent of the injury. LCL injuries can be graded in two ways, um, depending on how much gapping you get in your varus test or how much of the ligament you can see is injured on an MRI scan. So let's first look at the varus test. Uh, LCL injury is seen as stable or grade one if you do the test and it doesn't really gap, there's a strong end field to the movement and it is only pain that you feel over the outside. Then grade two or a slightly unstable or less stable injury is when you do the gap test and there's a bit more movement compared to the uninjured side, but it's not a lot. So it's between five to 10 millimeters that you get extra movement when you do it. And then an unstable, and the, the important thing also is that there's an end feel to that grade two one. So it gaps a bit extra, but then something stops it from moving further. But then a grade three or unstable LCL injury is when you do the gap test and it moves more than 10 millimeters and you're not sure that you're actually feeling a proper end feel there. That's usually an indication of a less stable or unstable one, grade three. Grading according to MRI scans, grade one is you can see that there's irritation over the ligament, but minor fibers that's injured. Grade two is significant portion but not fully torn. And grade three is a fully torn tendon. So it's pretty much more than 85% torn um, is seen as a grade three. The research shows that it's the results of the gap test when you do that various test that should decide whether you need surgery or not. If the gap test is done and it doesn't show that much extra movement, so grade one or two on the gap test, you usually can get better through just wearing a brace for several weeks plus following a rehab plan, more on that later. But if you have significant gapping, which means you've also injured some of the other structures that stabilize the knee, then you may need surgery. Now, some evidence from the research, and remember the research links are in the description of this video if you want to read them. Um, there's a study on NFL athletes where they looked at um, athletes with isolated complete ruptures of the um, LCL, and they looked at how do they compare if they just follow a bracing protocol plus rehab versus if they do surgery? And they found the ones that used the bracing protocol actually went back to play more quickly. And for long-term results, there was no difference between surgery and um, the bracing protocol. Equal likelihood of who could go back and who couldn't go get back. So the conservative option is better because you actually can get back to play more quickly. Also, there are several case reports in the literature um, for adults as well as children that show even if you have a complete rupture with a avulsion fracture, so that's where a little piece of bone is pulled out, you can still recover through a conservative um, approach as long as you haven't injured any of the other ligaments in the knee. Um, and this was found for sports like jiu-jitsu, rock climbing, and even football or soccer. What recovery times can you expect? When can you back, get back to your sport? Well, the guide, guidance for getting back to sport is that you should only go back to, to sport once you have full pain-free range of motion. So that means bend it fully, straighten it fully, no pain, as well as during your, act, your, your exercises that you're doing. There's no tenderness left, so it's not sore over the outer side of the knee anymore. And when you do that gap test, it means that there's no extra gapping there and it is not painful when you do that. Then you can consider going back to sport. Now, how long does this take? If you have a grade one, it usually takes about four weeks to get back to controlled sports. So what are controlled sports? It's things like yoga or um, rock climbing, where it's slowed controlled movement. You have time to think about it. But for sports that involves quick twisting and running and change of direction, so we're thinking football, soccer, those type of things, for grade one, it usually takes about six weeks to safely get back to that and complete your rehab. Then grade two tears, it takes about 12 weeks to get back to running, quick changing of direction. Isolated grade three tears, so only your LCL is injured, even though it's completely ruptured. That took, takes about six months to get back to sports that involves quick turning and changing direction. If you're only doing very controlled sports, so again, we're thinking you yoga, it may take as little as eight weeks, even with a complete rupture, to get back to those, just because you are so controlled in the movements you do there. However, if you've also bruised your cartilage or your bone when you injured it, um, 
yoga may, may even take three months or longer to get back to. If you've injured some other structures in the knee at the same time, then it's going to take a lot longer. So if we think of recovery after surgery, if it's an isolated LCL reconstruction, then it takes about six months to get back to full sport. If it's a LCL reconstruction plus repairing other things like the posterior capsule or perhaps a cruciate ligament, then you're looking at at least nine months before you can get back to sports with quick changing of direction. So how can you treat your LCL strain without actually having surgery? Well, if you have a grade one LCL strain or tear, good news is you don't need a brace. You just need to wear really stable shoes so that um, when you walk, so no flip-flops, no, no slippers, anything like that, so that your leg doesn't move too much um, in and out. But also stay off uneven ground. So you want even ground because uneven ground's again gonna make your leg move more like that and likely strain your leg, um, your ligament. A grade two will require a brace for at least six weeks, but you'll be able to put your weight through it and start walking on it as soon as you've got your brace, but you have to wear your brace whenever you're walking around. Grade three definitely needs a brace and the brace will likely be locked in full extension for the first two weeks and only then gradually be allowed more movement. So the things you need in these braces is you need solid metal rods or um, hard carbon rods on the inside and outside to help stabilize the leg and you need a hinge to allow flexion and extension of the knee and if you've got a grade three that hinge needs to have the ability to lock in place for those first two weeks and then after that gradually set how much your leg bends and straightens. Now I've made a detailed video about this and I'll also put some links in the description of this one of examples of braces that can work for this. Now for the grade three tear your leg will be locked in extension for two weeks and you won't be allowed to put any weight through it during those first two weeks. That can be really difficult to do. You'll definitely need crutches because you'll have to walk using only your uninjured leg. But the problem with it being fully straight is you'll struggle to get your leg swinging through or you'll have to hitch quite a lot to get it through. So something that my patients find useful is getting what's called a even up. And it's literally just an extra rubber sole that fits easily onto any other shoes, it just pulls over it. And that makes the uninjured leg higher, which means this one that's now fully straight can swing through more easily. I'll put a link to that also in the description of this one, um, if you want to see what that looks like. Then with the grade threes, you're usually locked fully straight for the first two weeks. And then after that, over the next six weeks, you're allowed to bend it slightly more each week. And that brace will be locked in different degrees or angles as you go along to stop you moving it too far until you get to a 90 degree angle of knee flexion at which point the brace can usually be removed. Now if you're struggling to walk with your crutches and you want more advice on that I've made a whole video about different ways to walk with crutches so I'll put a link to that one in the description of this video as well. Now what about medication? So people often tell me in the comments oh I've been really proactive I've jumped on the anti-inflammatories as soon as I got injured. Well that's actually a really bad idea. You don't want to suppress the inflammatory response in most cases because inflammation plays a very important part in the healing process. Now, it's absolutely fine to take one or two of these tablets. You, don't, you haven't done yourself any damage if you have. It's just a, not that great if you're gonna take them every few hours on the hour or whatever for several days in a row. Also, the opposite is true. Too much inflammation can be an issue. So in some cases, you do need anti-inflammatories. That's why it's really good to get guidance from your doctor because they'll be able to help you understand whether you need it or not. But my advice is, if you only have mild discomfort, your knee will be painful, but if you can keep moving it and it's not that bad, then try to do it without any medication. However, if it's really swollen, really painful and keeping you up awake at night, then taking the medication is better than not taking it. Now, the final part to conservative management and equally important as the bracing part and they go hand in hand is your rehab exercises. And rehab exercises for LCL strains um, aim to get your range of motion back, but also to strengthen the muscles that support the knee and also improve your balance and control in your leg so that you get um, less side to side movement when you move and that can help reduce the strain on the ligament. But it's quite important that 
at the beginning, you choose exercises that don't actually strain that injured area. Now, it will make this video too long if I go into details about exercises here. So I've made a whole video about just for exercises for LCL tears or strains, and I'll put a link to that video in the description of this one that you can find with examples of exercises as well as things to look out for that you don't want to be doing. Okay, so I was busy editing the video and then I realized that people are gonna ask me why haven't I said anything about ice or heat or ultrasound or laser. It's because, honestly, it just doesn't add that much value and the research doesn't really support its use. So ice can be useful during the first few days, um, especially if you've got a lot of swelling. Now, if you want to know how to use that safely and sensibly, I've made a whole video about that. But as for heat, doesn't really help healing and if you use it too early on it can actually increase your swelling and internal bleeding. Um, ultrasound has so far not proven to have much benefit at all for ligament injuries. There's some evidence that laser can perhaps help but it's not by a lot so I wouldn't go out and pay for it but if you have access to laser and you don't have to pay for it then you could use it if you like but it's not something that I would spend money on. Brilliant! Hope you found that useful. Now remember, if you need more help with an injury, you're welcome to consult one of the team via video call. The link to the website is in the description of this video. Take care.